All right, so hello everybody. It's 6.30 a.m. right now and I am on a keto transition, which is a hell. I'm getting back to my uh, carnivore diet, which I am frequently doing for my ADHD as carnivore diet increases my focus exponentially and it gives me right amount of energy to turn myself into a sitting flesh. Now, the thing about keto diet is that basically, um, I'm sorry, not about the keto diet, but about keto transition, is that you experience all sorts of symptoms. You have a feeling of worthlessness because you have a serious brain fog, a lethargy, headache, and all sorts of things like depression and stuff. And one major problem with keto transition is that you have insomnia you have problems uh, falling asleep. And one reason for that is because during a keto transition, insulin drops and a, a correct type of amino acid doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier so that it can be turned into serotonin. It is tryptophan. And serotonin is needed so that it can then be converted to melatonin. And melatonin is a neurohormone that signals to your brain that it is time to sleep. So apart from the fact that I have delayed sleep phase disorder, which is another uh, factor, during a keto transition, I get an additional insomnia and sleep deprivation, which I think is evident in my uh, latest videos where I am definitely exhausted. However, the thing about it is that you still need to work. You still need to see how you are going to do even when you are not at your best. So right now I will work on my writing sample that I need to upload uh, uh, to my um, university application. Uh, namely, I'm writing an essay about Heidegger's concept of the nothing, where I will argue that nothing is not a concept in his philosophy, but rather a meta concept that opens up and unlocks his other major concepts. I will also argue that uh, Heidegger's concept of the nothing uh, is basically an epilogue to Western metaphysics. And also, if I have enough space, I will argue that his concept of the nothing predicts the future theories and ideas that will come up after Heidegger, such as, for example, the gender theory. But um, I have a word limit, which is 2000 words, which is another challenge because I generally like to write. So, you know, that's it is what it is. And um, uh, let's get to work. All right, so uh, basically I am dead, as you can see. So since um, today I was um, working on Heidegger, I want to make a quick but somewhat insightful comment about the somewhat superficial distinction between depression and happiness. Now, today, irrespective of me being on a keto transition, I forced myself to work and it came out to be successful. Um, then I went to do some things. I had to pick something up. And in the end of the day, and this is the end of my day because I woke up at 4 a.m., I felt happiness. And since I was reading Heidegger, uh, there was something that I realized which was building up in my psyche and now it became somewhat explicit. And most of the time, realization is in some sense making explicit what was implicit in the past. And the thing about depression, before I touch the issue of happiness, is that most of the time when people are depressed, they're not just instantly depressed, or they're not depressed because one particular thing happened, or that they have a challenge that they cannot respond to. This is not enough to warrant depression. Most of the time what happens is that contingencies pile up to a such a high degree that one becomes helpless. But there are people who are helpless, but they don't really realize it since they are very concentrated at solving their problems and therefore they're not depressed. So depression then is sometimes has this philosophical property of 
a sudden realization where you realize different things coming from different spheres of existence have invaded your psyche to a such a degree that you are completely surrounded with um, obstacles that you cannot solve. So there is this thing of coincidence and accidents when it comes to depression. So most of the time when a person is depressed, it so happens that different things coalesced and invaded your being to a degree where it deactivates you. It discourages you to the point where you no longer find any meaning in pursuing your goals. So that's what I wanted to say, namely that there is this inescapableness when it comes to a depression where you do not see light irrespective of where you look. So then if depression is at, at least in some times, it results from different things piling up accidentally. Happiness too is a flip side of that. Because happiness, uh, of course, uh, as you might have known already, is not a purpose of life. It's stupid. Um, you could say that the purpose of life is to have a purposeful life. And I think that's it. So happiness then, as a side effect, uh, takes place when different good things coalesce. It so happens that like a clockwork, you find yourself in a situation where everything works. You don't feel demoralized. And so today, since uh, irrespective of obstacles, I found myself in a situation where I was still able to do everything I like to do. I went out, do my, did my things. Um, had a quick workout, consistently keeping the diet, had numerous insights while working on Heidegger, I, I, I felt it again. And I realized that, you know, actually when it comes to happiness, it's not that, it's not a big thing. If it so happens that your day passes where you find yourself satisfied with yourself, I'm sorry for the tautology, um, most of the time it suffices for you to feel happiness. So I want to now concentrate on the concept of contingency. Most of the time when you are happy, it is a function of limiting contingencies. There are less things that would invade your self-recurrent discipline, your self-recurrent rituals, let's say. And generally one key, you know, life coaching guideline to happiness is to adopt some form of rituals that are going to be self-recurrent and that will solidify the sense of the self. Because what you need to understand is that the thing about consciousness is that it stays self-identical over time. You do change, but there is this understanding of the self, which is you, irrespective of how much time goes. You are aware that when you were 16 or 12 or 9 or 23 or 30, it was still you. So consciousness maintains self-identity irrespective of time. And one thing about this self-identity, maintaining self-identity, is that the more you help that process of self-identity by adopting rituals that fortify your understanding of who you are, the more happy you are going to be. Because happiness has to do with memory. How whole your life is when it comes to understanding time holistically. When past, present and future points to you having authentically adopted a lifestyle that particularly belongs to you. The reason why I felt happiness today is because contingencies were minimal, nothing happened that was unexpected, and everything I did today belongs to me. It is my passion to work on philosophy. What makes me happy is when I get more insights into what I love, and most of the time, because I have ADHD, the thing that makes me happy is when I have a complete control over my cognitive faculties. And control is one key to happiness. But when I felt that, which I immediately contrasted with depression, which has also this faculty of, you know, everything going out of control, where happiness is, is, is more of a, where you understand that, well, everything is 
going pretty well. I'm in control. And, and it was pretty symbolic that right when I got back and sat down, I broke the table, the one um, uh, that is behind me. Immediately, a contingency invaded me. It's like, no, you know, there is this meme. It's like Tom is sitting like this. And it's like when life suddenly goes so well, and he's like, that meme literally describes my life. The first time I learned about carnivore diet, I was so happy because I felt like an intense focus. I could read books for six hours a day. I was so happy. It was a new thing. I got COVID. Like, it, it nearly killed me. And, and th this is somewhat recurrent in my life because probably I'm very clumsy. And even today, contingency reminded me of, it, of its existence. It's like, well, sometimes unexpected things that you do not have control over will take place and you need to be okay with that. The table um, uh, broke, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. And uh, it is what it is, is something that you need to come in terms with. So today I was a bit out of my usual role, but this is what I felt and um, I wanted to uh, articulate and express that. So um, yeah, um, you need to own your life. It, it feels good. All right, so I was watching this um, anime. Know my name it is, or our oh, your name, okay. So basically there is this scene, grandma basically is telling her about the local deity, the Yuyan or something of that sort, like Dao, the, the usual Asian, where basically um, there's this one force that animates every particulars and you know, everything is that Yuan or Dao, which is not necessarily a good idea. I mean, the, the shit is you one and birds are you one. I mean, the, the your vomit is also Dao and the and the sky is Dao. This idea of non-differentiation is the reason why they never come with a um, scientific revolution. When everything is one and you cannot like stratify and sectorialize the world into particulars, you won't have a scientific they revolution. The you know, they every, it's, you see everything is interwoven into one another. This is the world of the right hemisphere and stuff and we're going to get to the uh, left right thing <laughs> just this is just a moment wait a second yeah and, and those you always see this thing with uh tapestry and uh, knitting and stuff it's also about the right hemisphere and integrity reasoning interconnections all of those stuff the world of the web as opposed to the world of the lego and minecraft okay but but now it's, you'll see a very good moment just a second that's also a union, okay. whether it's water, rice, or... Right. Also, just look at this moment, right? You have a grandma, and she's basically transferring her wisdom to her granddaughter, right? But in Western movies, there's the opposite thing going on, right? So, for example, um, look at the Home Alone. You have a complete reversal, whereby Kevin, the protagonist of the Home Alone, lectures a grandma, right? Uh, in the uh, Big Ben Tower. Wonder Child is the one who will lecture elders about what's going on in the world. Uh, but in Asia, it's the reverse. Uh, you might think that, um, you know, it's a usual stuff, but no, um, your understanding of that is false. Mine is way deeper because it, it's not just a cultural difference uh, the way your Marxist S wants, okay? It's, it's not that. Those cultural differences go deeper into neurophysiology, into biology, and, you know, when the um, becomes a genetics, of person, okay? It's a union. It joins their soul. Union which joins is why their the soul. offering we're making today is such an important custom. It's the right it hemisphere connects the thing, okay? with people. And then the special day dedicated to that, where everything, everything is contextualized, and, you know, but, but here, hey, here's, I can see it. yeah, right, get ready. This is where it is. This is the moment. The secret Relic. Okay. All right. So this is this is the moment. Okay. You see the circle, the mythic circularity, the mythic consciousness structure. The okay. But here's the thing, right? The this is the moment of you know utmost importance. Now you get to witness what differentiates the West from the East, from the quantitative mental consciousness structure to mythic consciousness. Imagine. Just, just for a second, imagine Mr. Beast seeing this shit 
imagine how he would monetize this. He would draw a circle. He would put some some of his slaves there. Tell him that he's going to give them a fucking million dollar. That they won't get a penny if they cross that circle and stuff. Imagine that that's the thing with western quantitative deficient mental consciousness structure right they try to monetize everything they try to quantify everything imagine just mr beast seeing that he would i don't know he would uh, nuke this place with rockets or he I, I don't he would do he would desacralize this he would uh, commit some form of a cultural crime that would uh, i don't know cause a, uh, a third world war between i don't uh, you know asia and and the united states okay and that's the thing with environment right environment itself doesn't have anything to say about what you should do with it it's the filter there are people who are going to you know be inspired with such landscape and they're going to have a spiritual experience and then there are going to be people who are going to investigate its you know its its biological underpinnings its its botany or I don't know, something. And there, then there are going to be people like Mr. Beast who are going to turn this into some form of money. So this was, this was, um, so this is the um, gigantic, gigantic uh, nipple.